Th thank you for the great introduction to the conference, John. And I just wanted uh, to also mention 47 Degrees, they do great t-shirts. And as you're gonna see this t-shirt, which says here, implicit pleasures, is a great thing to wear for this talk. Because the talk is about implicits, so or what to leave implicit. And uh, implicits have a lot to do with context. And contextual means what comes with the text but is not in the text. The con is the cum in Latin, so that it says it's with the text but it's not in the text. So we're gonna talk about essentially what that means and essentially how we deal with context because context indeed is all around us. Uh, uh, parts of the context would be, let's say, your current configuration, the current scope in which you are, let's say, for a compiler, that's very important. Or let's say the meaning of less than on the type you're currently looking at. Um, or let's say the user on behalf of which an operation is perform performed, the security level in, in effect, and so on and so on. So context is ubiquitous, it's pervasive. And that means that, well, we need ways to express it. And indeed, there have been a number of ways uh, uh, invented to do this, from the very mundane to the very elaborate. Uh, probably the most basic one is to say, well, context is just the set of your global variables in your program. So essentially, I'm in some part of the program, and the context which is around me is all the other parts of my program, and I just make it global. Well, we know that that's a bad idea by now, or it's a, it's a very inflexible idea, because uh, it means that if the context that we represent as global is immutable, it's very rigid. So you can't change a thing. It's always the same, so you, it's very hard to adapt to your, your program to new contexts, to new uh, circumstances. On the other hand, if it's mutable, and that's also a really bad idea because global mutable state is something that is very dangerous, that it doesn't work at all under concurrency, and so on and so on. So we have shied away from that and says, well, globals are out. So what do people do instead? Well, some of the more hardcore object-oriented programmers, they invented monkey patching. Who here knows what monkey patching is? Well, quite a few of you do, yes. Uh, and uh, who thinks it's a good idea? Nobody dares. <laughs> okay, so monkey patching, for those of you who don't know it, it means that basically I override things in object or in my root class. I just override them, uh, but I override them for the whole program to see. So some part of the program just changes this method up there. It's very popular in languages like Ruby. Uh, and that, of course, is a global effect, and it's a very invisible It's a global effect. It's an in insidious global effect. Uh, so we don't want to do that. So then people have invented lots of ways to do a dependency injection, either at runtime using Spring or Juice or some other framework, or uh, MacWire, that's a Scala uh, framework that uses macros to do the same thing. Uh, so dependency injection is essentially also something very elaborate and also hard to deal with. There's lots of rewiring done at runtime, um, guided by obscure things like either annotations or XML files nobody ever looks at. And then essentially it's supposed to work at runtime and sometimes it doesn't and what do you do if it doesn't? Uh, you can also do a dependency injection in the language. So since John uh, gave the intro, John actually invented the name for this uh, so infamous, famous or infamous cake pattern. It has its 10th birthday on Sunday. It has its 10th birthday on Sunday, great. <laughs> So, so you did it just after Scala Days uh, in about? No, 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 Scala Days is February. Oh, yes, uh, right, indeed. It was, it was way before that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so ten, happy 10th anniversary for the cake pattern. So the cake pattern is uh, sometimes called the Bakery of Doom. Uh, <laughs> Th that was actually at a time where uh, essentially the, the problem was that we didn't really have very good implicit functions yet, uh, sorry, dependent functions yet, and that therefore there really was no way to get out of the, the, the cake pattern. So by now I think it's, it's better tamed, but it is a way to do dependency injection which leads to very close coupling. Everything ends up in the same namespace, and that naturally supports recursion. And 
if I apply the principle of least power, so you should always use the feature that essentially just does what you want and not more. So if you want essentially not everything in the same namespace and you don't need recursion, then it means that the cake pattern is probably too strong for you. So what else can we do for all these things? None of these is completely satisfactory. Well, uh, Scala is a functional language and uh, functional programming has a very simple recipe. Parameterize all the things. Just use parameters. I mean, that's, if you need to get something from the context, then just make that into a parameter and pass that into your function. Very simple, very obvious. There's nothing more that you need. Except, well, sorry. Uh, the, the good parts of functional programming there is there are no side effects, it's type safe, and you get very fine-grained control. That means you can some, pass some parameters to your global function, and then you can refine as you need the context. So you can essentially either pass the same parameter or a, a changed version of your parameter down the call chain. But sometimes functional parameter passing is too much of a good thing, which means it leads to a lot of parameters. Sometimes methods have dozens of parameters, a sea of parameters, most of which hardly ever change. Most of them you just pass down to the other functions, uh, down the call change. And that means that the code ends up being repetitive, boring, and because you have to do so many repetitions, prone to mistakes. So you might swap the order of some parameters or just mistype one and get something unexpected. So a more direct approach would be to say, well, if passing a lot of parameters gets tedious, then leave some of them implicit. And that leads us to implicit. So I believe that if there's one feature that makes Scala Scala, I would pick implicit because there's hardly an API without them. They enable very advanced and very elegant architectural designs, and they are also misused way too often. So they are essentially the cornerstone of what we are grappling with when we do Scala, in, the good, in, in a good sense and in a problematic sense. So in this talk, I want to take you through what I believe are the most common uses of implicits, uh, give you some recommendations of what are good use patterns, what are not so good use patterns, and then I also want to take you through a set of proposed language changes that will make implicits even more powerful and hopefully also safer to use. So let's get started. Ground rules. So just to get everyone on the same page, I believe everybody has dealt with implicits, but maybe you haven't really the rules in, 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 in the back of your head. So the rules are really very simple. The first rule is if you do not give an argument to an implicit parameter, one will be provided for you. Compiler will do that. And for that, it will essentially look at all implicit values that are visible at the point of call, and those are eligible. What visible means, it means you can see it by an import, by an inheritance, or you define it at the scope, or it comes in some way with the types that make up the implicit. There's some, something called the implicit scope, and the details are not so important. The important part is you rarely care about where it is. The, the, the rules are so formulated so that the, essentially the implicits are usually there when you need them. Uh, now, it could be that you have more than one eligible candidate, and then essentially there's a, a contest which picks a more, most specific one, where, where most specific means essentially the same thing as for overloading resolution. So it's the same rules that pick a most specific method for overloading resolution. They pick essentially a best implicit. And if there's no unique most specific candidate, then you get an ambiguity error. So that's essentially all you need to know about implicit parameters. And implicit parameters, they have a sibling uh, that's implicit conversions. Uh, so uh, they are very similar to implicit parameters, except by that they have a different criterion when the compiler applies them. So the criterion is that if the type A of an expression does not match the expected type B, then the compiler tries to find an implicit conversion method from A to B, and the way it does that is essentially just the same thing, same way of uh, uh, finding essentially a function from A to B as an implicit parameter, close enough. So, and the rules for specificity and, uh, and ambiguity are the same as for implicit parameters. Okay, and, and then there's a third thing, which is really just syntactic sugar, 
and that's called implicit classes. So that's just a shorthand for defining an in a class and an implicit conversion that goes into the class. So if you write something like this, implicit class C with a parameter X of type T, then that expands to uh, just a normal class and an implicit def, which has the same name as the class, and that essentially creates a new instance of the class. So that's just a, essentially a very compact way to define a class and a conversion into it. All right, so now we have seen essentially the space of language features that are around there. So now the question is, well, when should we use what? Uh, so when should we use implicits? Uh, so implicits are very powerful because they leverage what the compiler knows about your code. Uh, it knows that essentially certain values have certain types and therefore would fit in slots that essentially you leave open when you define implicit parameters. Uh, that is a great means to uh, remove repetition and boilerplate, but uh, it has to be said, when taken too far, that can also hurt readability. So how do you reason about when is, is, uh, is it's a good design to add implicit and when it's a bad design? So there, um, I actually want to take a, a page from Rust. You're gonna hear about Rust in the keynote uh, tomorrow. So uh, about a month ago, uh, the Rust launched a language ergonomics initiative where they talked about essentially this, the dimensions of implicitness. And essentially the idea is that uh, there are three important things that let you judge something that's implicit. Uh, first is applicability. So the question is, where are you allowed to elide implied information? Is that something somewhere specific or could it be every, anywhere? And is there something that, that lets you see that this is happening? Is there an indication that essentially gives you a hint that there's something elided, there's some implicit information missing? The next dimension is power. So what influence does the elided info have? Uh, can it change radically the behavior of your program or the types of your program? And the third one is scope. Uh, that means how much of the rest of the code do you need to know to find out what is implied? And is there always a clear place to look? So essentially the proposal uh, in, the, in this uh, language ergonomics initiative was to say, well, there should, you shouldn't be essentially dial the dial up max to the maximum in all three dimensions. It shouldn't, you shouldn't have something which essentially is completely invisible, has infinite power, and can happen everywhere, because that means that you are essentially, you've gone too far. So uh, you always have to balance things out. Uh, the other way dial to say, well, essentially, it can't be applied anywhere, it has no power, and uh, you always find out where it is would also be boring. That means, essentially, you wouldn't really, they wouldn't help a lot. So the, the aim is to find a good mean, uh, middle, middle ground, and uh, in order to do that, it's good to analyze things around along these three dimensions. So let's have a look at some of the patterns of implicit conversions first, and then implicit parameters applying this methodology of applicability, power, and scope. So let's see what, what we have here. What's the simplest pattern of an implicit conversion? Well, I would argue it's probably extension methods. It's this idea to, that we say, okay, we can, for instance, define here a class string deco, which takes a string, and it adds take and drop methods to strings, because, well, we know take and drop from lists, so it makes sense to add them to strings. And if we do that, then we can write val s string equals abc and s dot take three. So we can afterwards use the methods. Other languages have invented extension methods for this. In Scala, they are just rolled into essentially implicit classes. So if we look at that, it's essentially how easily is it discoverable that something like that happens? Well, essentially, you'd have to know that take is not defined in the class string itself. And uh, that is enough as an indication to say, well, it would have, have to be added as an implicit decorator. What's the power? The power is actually fairly low uh, because it just means essentially uh, it's analogous to just defining a static method out there that you apply to strings. So it's essentially just a syntactic convenience that you can use the dot and then the method. 
The scope where this is, well, these things could be defined anywhere and then imported in your programs. But on the other hand, IDEs help uh, in uh, tracing down uh, what happened. So here's a version of Eclipse. IntelliJ does something similar where uh, you see here on the left, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, uh, there's a double arrow here. Uh, which means there's an implicit conversion, and if you essentially hover on that, then uh, you get what you see here. It says there's an implicit conversion from S to string deco S, and it tells you where the conversion is. So it's, fa it's fairly good that you can track what, what happens here. Okay, so that's extension methods, uh, a very simple use of implicit uh, classes. A more elaborate use would be this light trait implementation. So we can extend essentially our implicit class. Uh, we can have our implicit class extend other classes. So we have again our class string deco, but now it extends order of string. And in order to do that, it must define a less than method uh, that you see here. So that means that's a, a way to make existing classes implement new traits without changing their code. And that actually was the original reason for implicits in Scala, because that is essentially a long-standing uh, problem in object-oriented languages, that uh, when you define a class, you have to essentially all the interfaces or traits it applies, you have to define with the class. And afterwards, you can't do that anymore. If you inf invent, let's say, a new interface, a new trait, like ordered here, well, the Java string class, of course, didn't know about that, but we still want to make string in some way ordered. So uh, the idea of essentially implicits originally in Scala was to make that possible. So that was the original use case, and that was also the reason why Scala never had extension methods, because we said, well, we really want to do that, and if we can do that, then ex essentially extension methods is just a trivial special case. We don't need a separate syntax for that. Okay, discoverability here is, I would say a little bit uh, less than uh, for uh, extension methods because essentially it happens not just when you invoke the method that it doesn't exist, but also when essentially you pass this thing to a type that it didn't implement before. So this also gives you a conversion from string to order of string. So it's a little bit less easy to see what goes on. Uh, the power is also relatively more because now you essentially can implement new traits. That's, that's definitely some power to have. And the scope is, again, fairly large, just as with extension methods, but IDEs help. Okay, so those were two examples of implicit classes. What about simple conversions, simple implicit conversions? Well, you know that in Scala, if you use a simple implicit conversion, then you need a language import for that, uh, which means that it's actually considered to be slightly problematic to do that. I, uh, it's unfortunately, uh, some IDEs are just too helpful. Again, mentioning IntelliJ, they will just add the language import automatically. You won't even see that. That actually was not the intention. The intention was you to have to type that to actually, and, and to use the type that typing of the language import as essentially a little bit of reflection whether you really should do that. But anyway, so there is a language import, but that doesn't mean that it's always a bad thing. There, there are actually some very good use cases. One is, going back to implicit classes, it's not always appropriate every time you have a conversion to create a new instance of the class. Sometimes that's too expensive. So you, want, you might want to apply something like hash consing or memoization, where you essentially have only one instance of the class or one instance per type, and you reuse the instances previously. With an implicit conversion, you can type that up, but an implicit class, of course, or doesn't let you do that because it implies the, or the instance creation every time you have the conversion. Uh, here's, a, here's a more uh, tricky thing, which is actually lifted out straight of the Dotty compiler, which is essentially the, our prototype compiler for the next version of Scala. So what happens here is that we have a class symbol and that class is almost empty. Uh, there's a little bit more in the real compiler than what I wrote there, but it's close enough. Uh, so a symbol uh, has uh, indirectly fields like an owner, a name, an info, which is a type, and a couple more. But all these fields depend on several things. One is the current phase the compiler is in, whether it's in the typer or in an intermediate phase where it transforms or in the back end. And also they could be different from one compiler run to the next. So these things, they, these 
objects, simple fields, they are depending on essentially the current phase and the current run. Now, in the uh, original uh, Scala compiler, the current one, uh, some of these things were done by essentially mutable fields. So essentially these things changed along the way. But uh, we tried to be more functional, so we, we decided that that's actually not a good idea. And what we really want to say is that the, all these fields together uh, constitute the denotation of a symbol, and that's just a function that takes essentially a context, and the context contains the current phase, the current run, and all these things, and it gives you back the denotation of the symbol. So it's a functional version of uh, denot. It's heavily optimized, it's cached uh, so that it's, it's, it's usually very, very fast, so there's no performance overhead to speak of in here. But the point is, since symbols are empty, I would usually have to write always symbol dot denot dot owner, symbol dot denot dot name, and so on. And that gets very boring. And it's also error prone because I shouldn't use some other denotation that's not my current context. So it's always the one of the current context and the current phase. And it's actually much better to essentially say, well, this thing is an implicit conversion and it just takes the context and it will give you the right denotation that is, that is the denotation matching your current context. So here you see that actually there's a fairly intricate implicit thing that is in a sense mandated by the wish to be purely functional. We want to be purely functional, no side effects, and we also want to be essentially clean and no boilerplate code, so that was an appropriate solution here. But I should say that there are also many, many anti-patterns with implicit conversions. And here are some, and uh, I have to say I'm, I'm taking my, myself at my own nose uh, that I'm guilty of essentially the one I'm showing you here. Uh, so uh, we've learned since then that uh, it's actually a bad idea to have conversions that go both ways. So if you have conversions between two things and they go both ways, I believe that's a bad idea now. And it's also really bad that to have conversions that change semantics. And uh, sometimes that's harder to see uh, than it seems. So at the time uh, when we did Scala 2.8, I think it seemed to be a really good idea to have conversions, automatic conversions between uh, Java collections, Java util collections, and iterable. So there were things in there, in, uh, they're, they're still, uh, you can still access them, uh, they're in collection convert wrappers, Java and Scala. So a conversion from uh, Java collections to iterable and back. So why is that a bad idea? Well, first they change semantics. How do they change semantics? Well, the, the issue is the notion of equality and hash code between Java collections and Scala collections is actually different. In Java collections, it's just EQ, it's reference equality, and in Scala collections, it goes deep. It essentially looks at the element. So converting one to the other means that suddenly your hash code and your equals will behave differently. Since they go both ways, it means that you're never sure what you have because you could always, the system could always have decided that there's a conversion that gets applied. It's really hard to track. So suddenly you're on very shaky ground. You don't know what you have and you don't know what the semantics is. Bad idea. So since then we have learned it's much better to use converters which are basically just extension methods which have essentially give you an explicit convert to Java, convert to Scala method on essentially the other the other collection type, and that way you are more explicit, uh, and that way you know what you do. So that was clearly an anti-pattern. Here's another anti-pattern, and that's conversions that undermine type safety, and I fear that's actually way too many in software out there, uh, because they're just so convenient. So here's another example taken from, I think, a previous version of the Scala compiler. I'm not, I don't think we do that anymore. Uh, so all Scala compilers have essentially a name uh, class, and uh, the names are essentially two subclasses, term names and type names. That reflects the idea that in Scala, then the same string, uh, character string, means a different thing when seen as a name, as a name for a term, for an expression, or as a name for a type. And then uh, there's a, an implicit class, string to name, that essentially adds uh, two methods, two term name and two type name to a string. So that way you can write something like abc dot two term name and that gives you the name abc in the term universe or two type name. So these are both very good uses. 
But then somebody decided that it's actually a good idea to have this thing here. Some implicit def in some very global scope that said, well, a string, uh, give me a string and I give you a term name, automatically, always. Because most of the time you want a term name, right? Except when you don't. So, so that means that here you have the situation that what this e effectively does, it undermines type safety. It equates strings and term names where it could also mean something else. And you could say, well, isn't that, isn't, isn't a problem, right? Because uh, in the end I get a type error anyway if I meant something else, except there are actually quite a lot of casts, so I might get the error at runtime, uh, that where a name is cast to a term name or type name because we know it's the right thing, so this thing might actually undermine our problem. And even if that wouldn't be the case, even if you would just get type errors later, those type errors would be a lot more obscure because there's this implicit conversion and you scratch your head and you don't know anything anymore what goes on. So definitely don't do that. Don't just for convenience sake have an implicit conversion between two types. And even more, don't do that, uh, have an implicit conversion between two pre-existing types. So because taking the same two term name thing here, so there's a string thing which existed before. Uh, we assume that term name also existed before and then somewhere else you dump this thing and says, well, anywhere this thing is in scope, which could be very wide, this actual thing was in a package object, uh, is uh, you, you get this inversion, uh, you, you, you get this conversion. So the discoverability is extremely low. You don't know what's happening. The power can be extremely high because essentially you can relate two completely unrelated types and the scope is very, very large indeed. So that is, I think, the case where we really maxed out all the three dimensions in the, in the, in the um, language ergonomics uh, 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 framework and that shows that it's a bad idea to do these things. Okay, so now we've covered implicit conversions. What about parameters? Uh, so here's an example of implicit parameters, which we all know and love. So we can have a sort function, and it essentially takes an ordering as an implicit parameter. And, uh, or you can, it, there's, there's a convenient shorthand for that. You can just write t colon ordering, which is called a context bound. It means the same thing as the line uh, above it. So here the discoverability is actually quite high because, well, you know the sort method, you know it takes a parameter, uh, you don't see the parameter explicitly given in the source, so obviously there must be something implicit that happens. The power can also be high or low, depending on what you want to do, but essentially you can synthesize uh, potentially, in particular with recursive implicits, uh, a very, very large amount of code that does very, very interesting things that way. And the scope is large, but uh, IDEs, and here I have to give a shout out to IntelliJ, uh, they, they can really help. So in, I, in, in IntelliJ, you actually can find out what the implicit parameter is that gets passed here. Okay, so implicit parameters, uh, have actually a surprisingly large number of use cases. Uh, I tried to go through the list and actually I, I had to cut it down because it wouldn't slide on one, fit on one slide anymore, so I'll concentrate on only those six that I've shown you here. So they can, implicit parameters can prove theorems. They can establish context, they can set your configurations, they can inject your capability, it de it de it de sorry, they can inject the de dependencies, they can model capabilities, and they can implement type classes. So let's have a look at some of these. So proof theorems. That's actually a very interesting aspect. Uh, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, there's a flatten method in list. Who knows flatten? Everybody knows flatten. So what does flatten do? It takes a list of a list of things and gives you back a list of things, right? So now there's a, there's a tricky issue. We want flatten to be a method in class list, but it does, it's not a method of every list. It's only a method of a list whose element type is another list. So one way we can write that, and it's actually written that way in the Scala library, is to essentially give you, give, require an implicit parameter here which says A equals list of B. So the 
element type of the uh, list A must be the same as list of B, where B is essentially arbitrary here. And if that's the case, then the result type of left hand is a list of B. So to make this work, uh, uh, I have to show you what, uh, what this equals is. So equals is just a trait uh, with two parameters, and there's a signal implicit uh, value of that trait value, which is called as is EQ, which takes a single parameter A, and it says, well, A indeed is equal to A, and here's the proof that A is equal to A. I just create a new instance of this equal trait. So what we have here is a special case of a very powerful and general uh, uh, methodology which is called the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So what the Curry-Howard isomorphism says is that you can treat a type as a theorem and then a program of that type becomes a proof of the theorem. So that Curry-Howard isomorphism is used a lot in theorem proving, interactive theorem proving in provers like Koch or Acta or Isabel, they're essentially all based on that principle. Every theorem prover is essentially something that uses Curry Howard with an interesting type system, uh, typically a dependently typed system. So that's, that's how that works. And we see that in Scala as well for essentially fairly simple uh, theorems like A equals list of B, and you can push that much, much further and do more interesting stuff with more, essentially, more uh, intricate theories as well. So here I should say that that's actually a language feature that, that essentially uh, was described in a paper called Generalized Type Constraint at Uppsala 2004, where essentially uh, the uh, Uppsala Program Committee and the community at large thought this was sufficiently important to actually have its own language feature because it's a general problem. I mean, how do you essentially get these, uh, these more complicated type signatures into classes? And it turns out that None of that is needed. If you have implicit parameters, they can actually do all the necessary proofs for you. So this is nice. What about establishing contexts? So let me just start with an example here. Let's say we want to do a conference management system. So conference management system, people submit papers to a conference, and then they are reviewers of the conference. And uh, the conference management system, one of the things it needs to do is it needs to make sure that a reviewer doesn't see the scores of their own papers or uh, papers of authors they have some sort of conflict with, like their students, their close collaborators, or things like that. So um, there should be a function score uh, in, that takes a paper and gives you back the score of the paper, and it should sort of know who asked what the score of the paper was, and if that person has a conflict with the authors of the paper, it should answer minus 100, just to give you one, some sentinel value for a score that's sort of blacked out. Okay, so one way to do that would be to say, okay, let's, let's say we have a type viewers, which is essentially represents the persons that can see, uh, that, that ask to see a paper. So for everything we do, we essentially pass this thing as an implicit value to say, well, uh, I want to see the score, and by the way, here are the people that want to view that score, that by revealing the score, we'll get to see that score. And then, essentially, you can have the logic here, which you say, well, if the persons in that viewer set have a conflict with the authors of the paper, then return minus 100, else return the real score of the paper. And then you could have derived functions, like to say, well, I want to get a function that gives me all the rankings of the paper from highest rank to lowest rank. So that doesn't ask the score, but indirectly, it would tell me the score if I could see all the papers, because I would see whether the paper was up there, high up there, or low, low there. So what that would do is it would essentially sort the papers, not by the real score, but by this essentially uh, sanitized score. And again, that would essentially just take the viewers as an implicit parameter. And then if you have a sys big system, then you just push it through. So for anything that essentially requires to see who are the current reviewers, who are the viewers of this paper, that needs essentially an implicit value. So you have to provide one. So typically, you have to get yourself an implicit parameter and so on up to uh, the very uh, start where essentially somebody asks a query. So what's nice is that this essentially uh, generally works automatically, but uh, if you want to change the context, if you want to change the set of viewers, you can do that as well. 
So at the bottom here, you have now a function called delegate, which says it takes a query, and that's a function from the set of viewers to T, and you want to delegate some tasks to some other person, P. Uh, so what that would, the way we, you would do that is you would take the query, and you would pass it now an explicit parameter called viewers, uh, where now you add P to the set of persons that can actually see, see that paper. So when you need to change the context, you can do that, uh, but otherwise it gets passed directly. Again, I should say, I saw recently a talk by somebody who uh, had, had looked at this thing and proposed a set of fairly sophisticated language extensions to deal with the security problems. And I just took that and said, well, we can do that with implicits, and here's, here's a way to do it with implicits. Okay. Configuration and dependency management. Uh, I've already shown you a lot of scope uh, code, so I just say that these are just special cases of context passing. So you pass a configuration like we, we pass the set of viewers, and uh, dependency management is basically the same thing. Everything that you have as a dependency gets passed in some context value into the parts that need the dependencies. You can also mix this sort of dependency management with the cake pattern that's called the parfait pattern by Dick Wall. So that just means you have a small cake. If some of these things are recursive, then you use a cake and you pass the cake itself as a dependency. Oh, there's one thing I forgot from the previous one. Why did I pass a viewer as another set of person as an implicit parameter? Uh, that's actually another important principle. Uh, with implicits, you always have to be very careful with your type. Never have a type that is too general because you have something that essentially, if any set of persons suddenly could be materialized, that would mean you undermine type safety. So typically, when you have an implicit parameter, then you close the type as far as you can, and that's what I did here, where I said, well, there's a class viewers that essentially takes a set of person, but it, that is not the same as a set of person. Much safer to do it that way. Okay. And finally, uh, implicits can implement type classes. So here you see uh, the usual way you do, let's say, ordering. So here's an ordering type class with a less method, and then here's an instance that says integers are ordered, and here's a conditional instance that says lists are ordered if the element type is, has an ordering. Lists have an ordering if the element type has an ordering. And the code is the obvious one uh, that I, I don't need to go into that. Okay. So. It's a surprising number of different use cases from capabilities to context to dependency injection to type classes to theorem improving. Everything can be done with implicits with one concept, just one concept with implicit parameters. Uh, but implicits are not perfect uh, yet, uh, so uh, I want to take the rest of my talk to uh, tell you how uh, I think we can make them better and how we're about to making them better. So there are five things. Uh, tighten the rules for implicit conversions, lazy implicits, multiple implicit parameter lists, coherence, and implicit function types. Let's dive into the first one. So we said implicit conversions are problematic, uh, in particular between unrelated types. Unfortunately, in current Scala, sometimes you get an implicit conversion without really having asked for it. So here's a question and it's lifted from one of the Scala puzzlers, I think Scala puzzler 54. Uh, so what does this print? You have a list, we have a, a list of suits, uh, and you have a printl method uh, that just forwards to console, uh, and you print, on, you print 42. What do you think this prints? Uh, probably not 42, otherwise I wouldn't have asked it, yeah? <laughs> We probably does something else. So here's a hint. List of string is a function from int to string. It's a subtype of function from int to string. And because it's a subtype of function from int to string, it qualifies as an implicit conversion. So by defining this implicit value here, you get for free an implicit conversion from int to string. Um, because that printon is actually the most specific one, so string is more specific than the other printon any, that's the one that will be picked. Oops. So what you get is an index out of bound exception, 42. Surprising and annoying. So we'd like to get rid of that, and the proposal is to indeed do that. So 
in the future, only implicit methods are, are eligible as conversions. So by just having a function one or a subtype of function one that will not give you an implicit conversion anymore. You have to write implicit def foo from A to B, and that will be your implicit conversion, and it will be cleanly separated, clearly separated from implicit parameters. Uh, so that, that there's a problem there in that they say that sometimes there's actually code out there that passes an implicit function type and you want to use it as an implicit conversion. So there needs to be some way to do that. So the, the idea is to have a, a new class called implicit converter, which is essentially a subtype of uh, the function class, and essentially have a global conversion like this to say now we have an implicit conversion from A to B, so that's a true conversion that he can use, and that would be applicable every any time I find an implicit converter. So that way implicit converters give rise to implicit conversions and they're the only implicit parameter that does that. Nothing else, neither function one, nor map, nor list, nor any of its subtypes can give you an implicit conversion anymore. So that's number one, and that's merged into dotty repo, so that's in there. Uh, number two is lazy implicits. So the, the reason for lazy implicits has essentially to do with uh, things like generic programming, scrap your boilerplate code. So when you synthesize code for recursive data structures, you can get uh, diverging implicit searches, and you might be tempted to just turn off uh, the, essentially the divergency check, but that would be no help because indeed the tree it generates as an implicit parameter is infinite. So it will just go on forever and produce an infinite tree. So that happens in situations like this one here where you have a pickle method, so a serializer method, and it says I know how to serialize essentially a sum of A, B, something that can be an A or a B, if I know how to serialize an A and I know how to serialize a B. If essentially the A itself is something that can be a sum A, B, for instance, list can be a cons, it can be a nil, sum of nil or a cons of the element type and again a list that's this recursive, recursive instance here, then that would lead you uh, to an implicit, uh, to a uh, diverging implicit. So the idea here is to say, well, what we are gonna do is we essentially give you the power, if you have normal, if you're norm in normal recursion, if you're too eager, then there's a way to sort of stop the in infinite uh, recursion by having call by name parameters. To say, well, we go down that path only if we need it. And for implicits, we're gonna do the same thing. So if you write these two picklers with by name parameters, then what you get is essentially a, 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 a a, a terminating uh, implicit search, which furthermore creates a lazy val uh, that at runtime you also get something that nicely terminates. So that change was originally proposed by Miles 7 to me. It's a more robust solution of the current lazy type in shapeless. So lazy is sort of a pretty, pretty weird macro hack, uh, hack and it's, it's, uh, it's a bit fragile, so this thing is, is more solid. Implementation status, so that's also been merged. Um, the third thing uh, we want to do is multiple implicit parameter lists. So implicit parameters are a bit irregular in the sense that uh, they always come last and you can only have one of them. So whereas normal parameter lists, you can as many of them, have as many of them as you want. And that leads to some awkward workarounds. Uh, so if you know what the aux pattern is, that's essentially a workaround for this. Uh, uh, it also leads to a related problem in that it's sometimes quite confusing when a parameter is implicit or explicit. So you see that here at the bottom of the slide where let's say we have an, a function f and it takes an implicit context, let's say lots of functions do that, and it gives me a map from int to string. And then I want to write f of two and I get an error, which uh, the compiler says, well, I found an int, but I need a context. Oops, yes, of course. Uh, it, the compiler interpreted this thing as I, I wanted to give an explicit parameter for my context. So I can get around that by writing apply. I can write f dot apply, and then it's clear it's not this thing here, but it's the apply of the map. But it's annoying, and I, I essentially, it's like stubbing my toe against something hard. Every time it's the same thing, and I said, oh, yeah, okay, add the apply. It's annoying, I shouldn't have to do that. So 
the proposal is to actually allow multiple implicit parameter lists, which would, of course, compound that problem, make it even more confusing what's, uh, what, what gets passed where, and furthermore, go all, all the way in to let you imp mix implicit and explicit parameter lists, make, be, f to, to let you mix them freely. So you can have first an implicit parameter list followed by some explicit ones, followed by another implicit ones. It doesn't matter. But by, on the other hand, now the explicit application of an implicit parameter must be marked with a new magic keyword. So essentially you have to be very explicit that you pass an explicit argument to an implicit parameter. And the magic method we were, were proposing for that is called explicitly. So sort of the opposite of implicit, Im implicitly uh, that it uh, pulls out an implicit value. So in the new system, f of two would now be okay. That actually would just apply uh, the map. F of context, some context value would no longer be okay. So there we, you would get an error. I found a context, but I require an int. And you can still pass a context explicitly, but you have to write f dot explicitly context. And that makes it very clear that essentially that's now an explicit parameter, an explicit argument for an implicit parameter. The implementation status of this is, is it's for the moment, just a proposal. And the main challenge here that we're facing is actually the migration from current Scala, because we sort of have to turn things around and say, well, now you can't pass this anymore. And uh, only, essentially, we have to phase in first explicitly as an option, then force everyone to use explicitly. And only then can we essentially give you the goodies and give you multiple implicit parameter lists. So this will be take, take, take a while until we get there. Number four is uh, coherence. So that's um, actually a, a tricky and interesting issue. So I said implicits can implement type classes, as we can see them in Haskell. And that actually wasn't quite truthful. Uh, so they can sort of implement type classes, but there is an important difference. And the difference is that Haskell's type classes come with a requirement that they have to be coherent. So what that means is that in Haskell, a type can implement a type class only in one way. So you can't, for instance, have two ways that strings are ordered in the same program. You can't. So that's essentially the coherency requirement. And it's a global requirement. So it essentially applies to your whole program. Uh, it's very restrictive. It rules out like something that would make sense, like having two different orderings for strings. And it would also, of course, rule, rule out most of the use cases of implicits that we have seen, like implicits as contexts and things like that, because, of course, the idea of a context is that it can actually change. But coherence also provides some benefits. So there are actually some, some very good reasons why you would wish to be coherent in some situations. So here's a very simple one. Uh, let's say we go back to capabilities, implicit as capabilities. Uh, so let's say you have um, a set of classes that model the capabilities to drive various sorts of cars. So there's a can drive thing, which means you can drive a car. And there's a can drive truck, which is a sub capability of can drive. So that means you can drive a truck. And then there could be another capability that means you can drive a cab. And, uh, now we have uh, a drive car method, and that, re of course, requires the capability that you have a driver's license, so that it requires the can drive implicit. And let's say you have a multi-role thing that where you say, well, we need, a cap we need to, uh, the capability to drive a truck and to drive a cab. And now we say, well, uh, I have both of these capabilities, and I just want to drive my car. Uh, but in current Scala, actually, Current Scala wouldn't let you drive your car. Why is that? Well, it, the reason is, well, it says, well, you can drive a truck and you can drive a cab. I can't decide which ap uh, capability uh, apply to let you drive a car. It's ambiguous. You get an ambiguity error. And that's bad. And there's actually situations like this. Uh, that came up, let's say, in the CATS uh, library, where essentially these things are much more complicated. So instead of uh, uh, trucks and cabs, it's uh, Traverse and, and Monad uh, that uh, are in similar situations that you have two capabilities and you have a base capability and they imply, both imply the base, but you can't decide which. So these 
problems are very hard to work around, and the ambiguity errors are very annoying, so it would be nice if we could get rid of them. So the proposal then is to allow type classes, or traits, right, uh, to declare themselves coherent. So the idea would be that there's a new marker trait, Scala type class coherent, where you can say can drive extends that thing. And then that would mean that the compiler would have to check that the coherent trait has only one implementation per type. And it's quite tricky, but essentially there's a straw man proposal out there for what, what would be the right rules to check that a type is coherent. And once we do that, then we can actually drop all ambiguity checks for coherent implicits because we would know that it wouldn't make a difference. So one interesting aspect of that is another capability we'd have, we'd have to take away is that to ensure coherence, we actually would have to disallow operations like equality tests, hash code, is instance of on coherent types. Because that way you could sort of always figure out what instance you have. And the idea of coherence is to say, well, it shouldn't matter what, in, what instance to have. This instance is just as good as the other one. So we can't let you do that anymore. Uh, so, and it turns out that actually there are lots of other contexts where it's a good idea that we take away the capability to do equals hash code uh, is instance of. Uh, and these can all be summed up under the name parametricity. So parametricity gives you theorems for free. It's, uh, there's a lot of theorems that you get essentially just from your types. And uh, uh, the fact that you have all these methods, equality tests, is, is instance of destroys parametricity. So theorems for free are actually not theorems in current Scala. So there, there's, there's a proposal on the table which has to be implemented if you want to implement coherence, which is to say that we want to change the top types to this. So instead of just having any, any val, any ref, there's now an intermediate type, any object, and any wouldn't have any of the problematic methods, so it would be a true top that, with which you can't do anything, and any object would then actually have all these methods that you know from any, and uh, any has a single escape hatch method as instance of, which is sort of our one recourse to do dirty things, uh, which we need uh, if we want to do something which is implementation defined and things like that. So that's so, sort of the only way that we could get out of any. And uh, on the other hand, we would say then it's completely the responsibility of the programmer. And if programmers want parametricity, they don't use as instance of. The implementation status of that, it's, it's an open issue. Uh, and uh, if people want to get into the discussion involved, in particular, what are the right rules to guarantee coherence? I think there's a lot of scope in that, and that will be good. The last thing I want to talk about is implicit function types. Um, and that's actually the thing that excites me most, so I have to uh, go, go as fast as I can for that. So let's have another look at the conference management system. So we have this system that we get here. And the one thing that gets a little bit tedious is that we always have to write these implicit parameters, right? Implicit vs, vers, you see it twice. And uh, in, a, in a larger system, it would, you would get see it more than twice. Uh, so having to write implicit vs viewers a couple of times doesn't look so bad, but if we take the Dotty compiler as an uh, other example, we actually have more than 2,600 occurrences of the string implicit CTX context in there. More than 2,600. So it would definitely be nice if we could get rid of them. How can we get rid of them? So let's look at one of these functions that takes an implicit uh, uh, parameter again, view rankings, and massage the definition a little bit. So instead of writing it this way, I write it this way. It's exactly the same thing. It's just essentially I put the parameter on the right hand. Instead of making a method, I make a parameterized method with and a lambda on the right hand side. So it's a closure, uh, which, and for the closure, I, I can actually write implicit vs viewers, which means vs is visible in here in this thing, so it gets automatically passed to score. Okay, so not a big thing. So the question then is, if I do that, what's the type of this right-hand side here? So, so far the type is viewers to list of paper. So that's viewers, that's the thing, and it gets a list of paper. Because we can write implicit for a closure, but we, so far we can't write it on a, on a type. So the proposal is let's change that. Can we give it a type called implicit viewers to list of paper? And 
that would have to be sugar because the arrow is just a shorthand syntax for function one. So analogous to function one of viewers list of paper, we would now have an implicit function one of viewers and list of papers. Okay, so so far, that's just syntax. I just said, well, what if we could write this implicit there, thing there? So what does it mean? What should it mean? Well, um, oh, sorry, before I say what should it mean, I have to tell you what uh, implicit function one looks like. So implicit function one is just uh, the same as function one, uh, only it has an apply method which now takes an implicit parameter. So otherwise, it's the same thing. It, uh, it's, a, it's a subtrait. And analogously for the other arities. So what do they mean? Actually, uh, they can be given a meaning quite simply. There are just two rules for the typing. The first rule is uh, quite uh, obvious. It says, well, if I have an implicit function type, f, and a value of that function type, then essentially I pass implicit arguments in here, as I would do for a method. So f, if I just write f without an argument, then it expands to f of a. I just pass the implicit parameter into the implicit, uh, the implicit argument into the implicit parameter. And the second rule says that if I have an expected type, which is an implicit function, so the expected type of, say, let's say, b is implicit a of b, then the compiler would essentially create the closure automatically. It would just say, well, uh, I have a b, I need an implicit a to b, well, let's create a closure implicit of an unknown, unnamed parameter of type a, and it returns a b. So I will automatically, essentially, satisfy the contract that I need an implicit function. Okay, so that's the two rules that I have. And with those rules, I can re revise the conference uh, management example, as you see here. So I could now have a type alias. The nice thing that of having types is I can name them. I can abstract them. I can have a type alias viewed of t, which is implicit viewers to t. So that's a thing that's viewed by something. That's, that's important in the information of the type. Okay, and then I could have my score paper. Now, you see it lacks the implicit parameter section. It doesn't have that anymore. I just say, well, it's a viewed of type int. The return type is not just int, but int that's viewed by somebody. So what would happen is the compiler would expand this viewed thing to, uh, to the alias. and would say, okay, that's an implicit function type. That's the expected type of the block. So I have to convert the block into an implicit closure, so something that takes the right implicit parameter. And the same thing for the other things. And if I want to <coughs> essentially pass the parameter explicitly using still the old syntax, uh, not the new one that I've proposed, I can do that as well. I can just pass it into the query that you see here. Okay, so you could say, well, yeah, that's nice, but isn't it a little bit inefficient, all these closures that I create on the right-hand side with these implicit parameters? Well, actually, it turns out that they can be optimized. So instead of writing, instead of creating a closure like this, so all these implicit function closures that would be created by the expected type, I can actually optimize the function immediately and say, well, let's, let me just create an implicit method that takes the implicit parameter here. So the cost of implicit functions is brought down to simple implicit parameters. And that thing is also merged, so that's also part of Dutty. And it, I believe, is a much better alternative to something that is uh, moderately popular out there, and that's the reader monad. So reader monad is actually fairly similar to these implicit function types, ex except that it wraps the implicit reading in a monad. And it has the same advantage as implicit function types, namely that it's very concise because this reading can be abstracted in a type. It's just reader of t, and that's your return type, and essentially then you just have the usual monad plumbing. But I believe it's really bad. It's a really bad idea because it's shooting sparrows with cannons. Monads are all about sequencing. So a monad really fixes the order in painfully obvious ways, flatten up or four expressions. It fixes the order in which you do. C passing a context has nothing whatsoever to do with sequencing. You, you shouldn't be forced to essentially fall down into a monad context just because you pass a value into this. So it's really, it's sort of the same shortcoming of the cake pattern. It's too, it forces you too much, it, 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 it can do too much, it essentially monads can influence sequencing in arbitrary ways and passing a context has nothing to do with that. So I believe you shouldn't use a monad. 
Implicit function types give you the same concise as, as the reader monad. They don't force you into monadic style with uh, explicit sequencing. They're fully composable, and they're more than seven times faster. We've measured that in a, in a simple example, so we got more than seven times speed up over the reader monad. Just wanted to finish with an encore. Uh, so uh, who here knows what the builder pattern is? That comes from another. OK, cool. Yeah, so builder pattern is quite popular in languages like Groovy, Kotlin. I guess there are probably others. So the idea is, wouldn't it be nice you could set up a table like this, where you just write table, and then you write row, and you, then you write top left, top right as cells, and things like that. Can you do that? In uh, Kotlin, uh, they in, have invented a special thing called a receiver function, which does some funky things with the this meaning in functions to make that work. With implicit functions, is there a way to do that in Scala? In fact, there is. So here's the Scala implementation that you see here. So the idea here is to get a table. So what is that thing here following the table? Well, that must obviously be the argument to table. So what is that argument? Well, that must be something that essentially can add itself to a table. So it's the init thing is an implicit function from table to unit. And essentially, the way I create it is I make a new table, I call in it, and then I return the table. So what the thing does then is essentially it would take this table thing and the row and ultimately the cell thing would add themselves to the table. So uh, in cell, you see that at the end where you say, well, we take an implicit row and we add essentially a new cell thing to the row. And the intermediate one, the row thing, would have essentially combined both. It would get the implicit table from the environment. It would essentially take as a parameter the init function, which now takes the row to a unit, creates a new row, calls the init. So now the cells add themselves to the row. And finally, we add the row to the table. So this is rather nice. So it seems that we can actually do these things, uh, these uh, DSLs uh, with implicit functions. And I actually have a conjecture here, and I think that in any situation where an entity is implicitly understood, you can express that with an implicit function type. So it's really powerful. So what we've seen are two examples in the talk, the current set of viewers and the structure to which current code should be added. But there are many, many more. So like the current configuration, the currently running transaction, the capabilities needed to run this code, and even the effects this code has on the outside world. So I believe it's really a very, very profound thing. Uh, you can find out more about this in a blog that uh, has appeared some months ago on Scala Lang. Uh, and to summarize, I believe that implicit function types are a really neat way to abstract over contexts. They're a very powerful feature because you let, they let you inject implicit values in a scope simply by defining a type. And I believe they will fundamentally affect the kind of code we will write in the future. Uh, if we summarize the whole thing, then I believe that implicit parameters, I hope I've shown you that they are fundamental and really powerful language construct. What I like about them is they're really just parameterization. They're on the, on the bottom of it really, really simple, but they remove the boilerplate. A single construct has, as I've shown you, a huge number of use cases, very, very, a lot of different use cases, very multifaceted. And with implicit function types, they become abstractable. So that means you can essentially just name the thing, put it in a type, use the type, and uh, get and avoid the repetition. Implicit conversions, on the other hand, are also convenient, but I believe they should be used with a lot more care. So that's essentially, if there's one take back from the talk, then uh, that should be it. Uh, when can I expect all this? So I was talking about Dotty a lot. Uh, so uh, the plan is to essentially come out this year with a minimal viable prototype for Dotty, which is essentially a developer preview, and go to, through a number of 0.x releases. And then by, probably by the time 2.14 is out, have uh, a first release of Scala 3.0, which will uh, contain all these things that I've talked about. And I should also give credit to the people who've worked very hard on this. So uh, a lot of people have contributed to the Dotty project. Uh, I put, uh, have the names of the most important contributors here on the slide. And uh, we also work very closely with the Scala C team at Lightband with Adrian, Jason, Lucas, Seth, and Stefan. 
thank you. And I should say that uh, just one last uh, uh, thing is uh, there's a book signing uh, with, uh, uh, where Bill Venners and I are happy to sign books, uh, our third edition programming. It's got any book that you want to put in front of us. We'll sign everything. <laughs> and uh, that will be uh, tomorrow uh, during lunch. Thank you.